Hello, fellow cyborgs, and welcome to another mini, yeah, mini, mini wrap up and kind of large haul today. I am excited to show you about the new books I've acquired and talk to you about three really great books that I recently read. So let's talk about two audiobook rereads. I decided to re-listen to the audiobook The Angel of Darkness by Caleb Carr, narrated by George Goodall. George Goodall does an amazing job with these audiobooks. I find them obsessively, obsessively listenable to. Listenable? I just always want to listen to them. I, I make excuses for listening to these audiobooks when I listen to them. The Angel of Darkness is the second book follow-up to The Alienist, but I listened to this one first in the last few weeks. When I first read it, I was not as impressed with it as I was with The Alienist. I found the mystery was a little bit more all over the place and overly complicated, but upon this reread, I loved this and I ended up boosting it up to five out of five stars. Upon listening, I found the mystery not overly complicated, but just complex in a very pleasant sort of way for me. I also really enjoyed the characterization from Stevie's point of view. This is narrated from a different character's point of view, this by Stevie, and I really enjoyed his perspective a lot more than I remember. The place that these characters are in in their lives as well, the main team of criminologists, I guess you could call them, is also just kind of more subdued and they're kind of all trying to work through issues that they're having after they had broken up between books one and two, or at least just kind of disbanded because the case was done. All of them were in a more complex emotional state and I found that a whole lot more interesting than I remember it being. I also really enjoyed that this book looked at themes of motherhood and a woman's place in the world and the idea that it is not natural for women to be more parental than men or if it is what the implications of that are and how that is really backwards to furthering sexual equality in the world. So overall, like I said, I just couldn't put this down and enjoyed every moment of listening to it and love this so much. I then, you know, decided to just re-listen to the first one while I was at it, and this one I didn't enjoy as much as I remember enjoying it, actually. The perspective for this book is John Moore, who is uh, kind of an asshole. He's um, a bit of a good-for-nothing criminal journalist who gets wrapped up in this mystery for reasons kind of incomprehensible to me. I don't really know what he brings to the team trying to solve these this this serial killer who's killing boy whores and i feel like he also just a really objectifies the women in this book in ways that i didn't notice when i was first reading it the characters are also just mm, I don't know, they just didn't quite feel like themselves because we were being introduced to them. And I felt like the mystery in this was less complex than in the second book, but that's mostly because a lot of the text needed to be taken up to establish the team and who these individuals were, and then also tackle the mystery. So we just literally didn't have enough time or have as much time to go into a complex mystery and still not have the, like an 800 page book on our hands. So still a very enjoyable listening experience but I actually was surprised that I didn't love this on, on re-listening to it. I still super enjoyed it. It's still one of my favorites, but I appreciated the sequel a whole lot more on rereading it. I finally got to Embers of War by Gareth L. Powell. I buddy read this front with Sarai from Sarai Talks Books, and I loved this. This was amazing. This was originally recommended to me by Becky M., not me personally, but on her channel. She read this twice last year because she loved it so much and wanted her 100th read of the year to mean something, and so she reread this. This gave me vibes similar to Ancillary Justice in that there is a ship that is artificial intelligence and has a voice in the book. It also reminded me a little bit of The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. It's not nearly as cozy as that, but the switching of perspectives, the world building, how it is not overly complex and yet you have so many questions that you want answered if you, you know, want a complete view of the world. And also just how this this story and The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet really emphasize the interpersonal relationships. It's not so much about the space adventure as it is about the people 
put into this adventure. This was also just like incredibly readable. Sarai and I were reading about 40 to 50 pages a day, which depending upon the book can be a little bit of a like time commitment that I have to sit my butt in a chair and actually read. But I found myself sitting down to read and then in a blink of an eye, I was done with the quota for the day and it was just like e the easiest thing to read. The prose was also surprisingly lyrical. There were parts in here that were just really beautifully written in ways that I wasn't expecting. So it was a fast paced read, but also really well crafted as far as like sentence structure. The characters were also all incredibly interesting. They were unique. There was huge female representation, which was great and different kinds of females in this. And even though you didn't particularly, or I didn't particularly like or was rooting for all of the characters of the different perspectives we got, they were all definitely individuals and complex individuals. And like I said, as far as the world building, it wasn't complicated, which was great. I wasn't bogged down with trying to understand the like millennia of history of this world, but it was complex enough to make me really interested to know more. And there was a kind of sense of lore in here. We kind of had a couple stories told to, told to us about the, the history of the world. And it was it was just really lovely. So the hype is real. You need to read this. It is wonderful and a fast read and interesting and thought provoking and has great characters and you should totally read it. It was great. Five out of five stars. Wonderful. I also read a lot of things about and by Beatrix Potter, but you can check out my A Lot of Beatrix Potter series for my reviews on those. I don't want to spend time talking about them here. So let's get on to my new acquisitions. I acquired quite a number of things, so let me just get to it. On May the 4th, I popped into my local comic book store for free and an international free comic book day, something like that, and finally picked up volume two of Pretty Deadly. This is a series by, let me get all of the cool people, by Kelly Sue DeConnick, Emma Rios, then we also have Jordi Belair, Sigrid Ellis, Clayton Cowles, Trisha Ramos, Lauren McCann, Cubbin and Lauren Senkovich. I absolutely loved Pretty Deadly Volume 1, which I read years and years and years ago. I have recently fallen off the bandwagon with comics and graphic novels, and I decided that since you know, this was a per perfect time to go to the comic book store that I would just pick up the next volume in this series that I've had my eye on since it came out because there was quite a gap between volume one and volume two. So looking forward to rereading volume one and diving into this uh, sometime later this year. I then went and visited my sister in New York State and they have used bookstores there, guys. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Unlike where I live and I just have to buy things online. So we went into a couple and some books fell into my hands, one of which though fell into my hands from my sister, so let me grab it. This is A Time to Wander by Shara Thompson and N.F. Johnson. My sister knows one of these authors in real life and decided to pass this along to me just in case I wanted to pick it up and give it a try. This is a dual narrative about an unlikely duo hitchhiking and whatnot in the 1970s in the United States. I am interested in seeing what this is all about. It is from a very small publisher, Solstice Publishing, and I am interested to learn a little bit more perhaps about the 1970s. I don't don't know very much about it, so we'll see. The only specific Buffalo related book that I picked up was I hadn't realized, but Mark Twain lived in Buffalo for quite a while. There was a really awesome display of him in one of the public libraries, and I was like, I need to get something about Mark Twain so I can read it. I had previously read Huckleberry Finn in um, high school. I don't remember if I, I think I did actually read that one. I didn't just spark note it, but I haven't read anything else by Mark Twain. And I found this really beautiful Folio Society edition of, it's a, a treasury of Mark Twain. So it includes essay speeches and fragments from some of his larger works in here. And it is a very, very nice frogs, <laughs> naked hardback. So I decided it would be a good idea to get a Mark Twain book in a Mark Twain specific locale. So there you go. This is a Star Trek The Next Generation novel. This is Nightshade by Laurel K. Hamilton, which some of you may know for her Anita Blake vampire paranormal romance series, which I read the first two or three of. I was just incredibly amused to find out that a paranormal romance writer also wrote for Star Trek The Next Generation, so I snapped this up. These books are delightful. I have read one other Next Generation novel, and it's just like a cozy extended episode with my crew who are awesome, so looking forward to this. There was also this really 
very jazzy skeleton. A short story collection by Ray Bradbury. This is one more for The Road. I love Ray Bradbury's short stories. His novels, not quite so much. So being able to pick up another short story collection on the cheap was very, very wonderful. I also really love Eva Ibbotson and her children's books, her children's novels, middle grade novels, I guess you would call them. This is The Haunting of Granite Falls. She tends to write about kind of spookier topics, but always has really thoughtful, lovely characters. I just think she's such an underrated writer and seeing this one on the shelves that I hadn't previously read or even kind of heard about and it's about ghosts and it's just sounds really wonderful so I needed to take this home. I also found this Steinbeck. This is the Acts of King Arthur and his Noble Knights. So Steinbeck really loved the King Arthur mythology and used to play King Arthur and his knights up by, I think it was called Castle Rock up in Salinas, which I was able to witness. It was awesome. And so this is his translation of the Mort d'Arthur by Mallory, the um, death of Arthur, very ancient text. So looking forward to reading more Steinbeck prose, though not particularly a Steinbeck story. But this has been on my wish list for ages. And since I didn't have to pay for shipping, I could just buy it right then. I decided to just put it in the basket. And then my final purchase, and hopefully fi hopefully my final purchase for, <laughs> for months, because I need to get that DVR down now, is Waterfalls of Stars by Roseanne Alexander, My 10 Years on the Island of Skomer. This comes highly recommended from Charlotte. I will link her video down below. It is a wonderful video and it made me instantly go to Saren Books and buy this online from Wales all the way across the pond. I originally heard about this on Harriet Rosie's channel, though I don't believe she's actually read it yet. And then Mercedes from Mercy's Bookish Musings recently read this and enjoyed it, though not nearly as much as Charlotte. So again, I will link her video down below. You should go check it out. This is a uh, nature writing nonfiction about a woman and her brand new husband, because they had to be married, to go be like wardens of the island of Skomer. And they stayed on this island for 10 years and were completely secluded and lived off the grid. And it just sounds like hard work, but also kind of idyllic isolation. And the introvert in me was just like, <laughs> So I, so I bought it and I'm really excited for this. So I believe all those acquisitions put my physical TBR back up to si 60, no, back up to 37, I believe. So not too bad. I definitely want it to be down under the 20s. I'm not sure if I want to like fully achieve a zero TBR anymore because I think I would am most comfortable with having maybe like roughly 15 books, give or take, on my bookshelves at any one time with the flexibility to acquire new things or read from the library. So yeah, we'll have to see, but I definitely want to focus on my books for a while. I need to stop letting awesome Beatrix Potter obsessions and library books get in my way. Well, not get in my way, just sidetrack me, but it's been fun. I've been having a really good reading year this year, I think. Definitely. Yeah, especially compared to last year, which was kind of a bummer. So it's been a lot more lovely. Thank, thank, thank you for watching. In the comments down below, let me know if there are any books I talked about today that you have recently acquired or would love to acquire and read one day. And let me know how your reading year has been so far. Have things been going good? Has it been kind of a bummer? What's What's been happening? Again, thank, thank, thank you for watching. And until next time, continue to be lovely.